So I've been Alex. I'm actually one half of the Sober Experiment. Um, and what I want to say to you really today is just about coping in this current situation with cravings and with practical advice on how we might try to get through the week. So this last week for me has been very much the honeymoon period of being at home is over and the boredom has kicked in and the lack of routine has kicked in and I'm trying very much to find a new routine and new coping strategies. Um, my advice to anybody at the moment, if you are dealing with either stopping drinking or maintaining your sobriety, would be to get yourself into a routine. Um, I've picked up my exercise again this week, which I've very much just thrown away. I have started baking every other day with my daughter, which is unheard of, and various other things. And I'm trying to have a little bit of a schedule. It's not, it's not rigid. It just helps me in so much as um, keeping myself focused on what to do day by day. Oh, that's me. Um, Mandy, how's your week been and what have you been doing? Um, I have not been great this week. Um, I suffer from uh, insomnia, chronic insomnia. I've had it probably all my life. Uh, Fear-based kind of early early years um and my kind of coping strategy was from about the age of 14 uh, smoking weed and from the age of 18 uh drinking um so when i stopped taking drugs and drinking uh, that was something that i really had to address um and i have complex ptsd so like i have a lot of anxiety about sleep um and so it's something that I have to, to manage. Um, and the problem for me, and it's always been the problem, and it's quite a problem for a lot of people, is that when the holidays come, when you lose that routine, then like my sleep really gets quite bad. Um, so I had two days where, I mean, I used to be on kind of antipsychotic medicine to get me to sleep. So I don't want to go back to that. So I had two really bad days. And... Um, and so I had to really just go back to basics and literally put in all the old rituals. So making sure uh, I get to bed early, but it, then it feeds into that kind of I'm boring and my husband's up and those sort of things. So it is a stretch and it is quite a challenge for a lot of people. Um, but I love my mornings and um, I've had two good nights now, so I'm feeling a bit better. So yeah, there's a lot to be said about routines. And I think that's the problem in these periods because a lot of people drink too much uh, or they kind of fall out of habits, new habits when they're in the holiday kind of situation. So um, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's just like um, just try to carve up the day and give yourself kind of blocks of time. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm all right. It's sunny today and, you know, I don't go out. I live in France, so it's pretty traumatic to go out because everything's shut and behind screens and things um so i'm lucky that my husband can go and do the shopping and i just literally stay at home and ignore what's going on out yeah what about uh you kate me uh, oh you know i'm all right those <laughs> uh, i just i think for this week it's just been like just one day right right back to ODAT like one day at a time has never seemed so pertinent right so you know one day like there was one day when I got up and I was like the kids had done their like homeschooling I've managed to log on I'd you know the food was all right and I hadn't sworn at anyone and I was just like okay like hashtag winning really winning today and the next day it was like I could barely get out of bed I was just really up and down and um and so I, I I feel like that yeah really trying to take one day at a time I really the whole thing about the routine massively resonates with me um and one of my major things with that is I just get up before anyone else does and get some meditation in I'm really not very good at meditation but I I'm just listening to insight timer app and lying down on my on the floor um i do a lot of that one thing i think is really good about lockdown 
because I really like lying down on the floor. <laughs> but I mean that in that sort of, if you're sort of spinning out and that whole triggered and things going a bit bonkers, actually we're not stuck in offices or rushing around maybe so much. So we can literally, you can actually get, just get down on the floor and do a bit of breathing. So I find that really helpful. And um, the other thing, I, I just think there's this sense this week for me and the people that I've been speaking to, um, a, a real sort of tension and, a, and an adjustment to both needing to connect, but also needing space. So it's been like, like feeling like a toddler again with like not really knowing the boundaries around who, when I need to take space and when I need to connect with people. So I think it's like that a bit of self-compassion about, okay, we're all in, this is all new to everyone and a sort of letting ourselves learn a bit and make a few mistakes, you know, and just being flexible about homeschooling and, yeah, and just so I've been curious, I guess, about well, what works in lockdown, what works uh, and what doesn't. And yeah, I suppose that's where I've, I've been at this week. Mixture of kind of really zen and then really shouting at people. <laughs> well, oh, I've got to nominate. Who do I nominate? Simon. Oh, thanks, Kate. One of the, <laughs> I guess for me, um, one of the things that Kate said there definitely resonates around your own space and I've found over this last week that I've been spending a, a, or looking for time on my own yeah we're all my wife my son we're all in the same house and it's quite easy to get on top of each other and for tensions to just sort of start feeling a little bit abrasive I mean we haven't had any bust ups or any shouting but I could feel after a period of time that may happen so we've all got a room that we can use I've got my office at home which is great and I've been spending a lot of time doing work on my website writing blogging I mean coronavirus is an all and sobriety are an awesome opportunity to write lots of blog posts that's for sure so I've been just getting stuff down on my blog and trying to use the time as proactively as possible and and almost seeking opportunity so I spoke before about looking for opportunities for things that you can do during this that you wouldn't normally do and I've definitely been doing that and doing some really nice things with my son like we had a sports day yesterday in the garden which we would never ever do and I thought that was really you know, a really nice thing to do it kind of ended in a complete mess but we yeah you know, we did it and training at home we've got the cross trainer out of the garage the exercise bikes out of the garage and we've been using it every day and of course I've been doing lives in my group for you know free live stuff that I wouldn't do we're doing this so I'm just kind of making the most of it and I haven't really felt myself get down I've been meditating every morning as well like Kate has that really helps just for 10 minutes um, and just kind of immersing myself in things that I probably would otherwise not be getting involved in and it's a it's a great time to be listening to podcasts learning you know grabbing a, a book a quit drinking book or whatever it may be interacting in Facebook sober groups and kind of immersing yourself in, in things but I have found that having a space is really useful and just somewhere you can go for, for some me time has really helped me so that's that's kind of how my week's been seven out of ten I'd give it and over to you Dave Cheers, I always follow you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, it's been weird. At the beginning of the week, it was like each day most into one, and it was doing my head in because so I was getting up at 11, 12, and I've never done that in my whole life. And then before I knew it, it's four or five, and it's like I felt really lethargic and, you know, what am I doing with my time and that? Uh, and then, funny enough, on my Instagram, it popped up with a annual memory like this time last year. And it was three months sober for me a year ago. And then I kind of thought, I wonder how I'd be feeling now if I was three months sober and what I would be feeling and how I would deal with it. And I think I would deal with it that I, rather than the one day at a time, I'd be doing it almost three each hour as it comes and break it down into small bits. And if I was feeling edgy or frustrated or... You know, if that Ryan Witch voice was coming in or the beer monster, I, I would just try and knock it 
identify myself as best as I can. And I think you know, Simon, that I, I, the way I've dealt with it, I've divorced myself from alcohol. It's like a, a mad affair that I had for yeah. 40 years, and then it, you know, I've ended it. So it would be like that little voice knocking on my door, and you either choose whether you answer it or not. And the more it knocks, the more you're like, do I answer the door or, Ugh. you know, so just occupy yourselves and, you, and, and watch a film, have a bath, go for a walk, you know, lots of little things to break it down to stop that little knock on the door creeping in so it gets louder. And it's been a really interesting thought pattern for me to think about all the guys that are at the beginning of their sobriety and how they are feeling through this. Uh, and because I feel quite strong. Also, I really feel for people that are at the beginning of their journey. And um, that that's how I've been thinking. It's made me feel quite positive, actually, because I, I do feel strong. And it's given me a little bit of a push to actually get up and do things as well, because I hate doing nothing. But this coronavirus has forced us in to actually sitting with our feelings and, and, and pondering about a lot of things and sometimes overthinking. And I'm a very sensitive person. I think that overthinking is that what gets me into trouble. So by keeping occupied is the the technique that I've used. I don't know if that helps anyone, but um, that's my bit. So, William, where are you? I'm here. Sam? Yes. You are looking about 12. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I've been I've been quite good to be honest. Um, so I'm just to explain to everyone I'm at home on my own during the day with um, my two young sons who are seven and nine. Um, so I'm trying to work from home um, and sort of keep them occupied and school them and all the rest of it. Um, so for me, it's to be honest, it's it's been okay because I think when you're looking after kids, you need two things: you need energy and you need patience. Um, I'm a great believer that emotions are catching. Um, so if people get if people start shouting at you and arguing at you and get angry with you, you start arguing and shouting back to them. Um, so the key for me is firstly you need a lot of energy with kids, and secondly, you just need to keep calm all the time. Um, even when you're bubbling up inside, you just need to hold on to it and keep calm. So if you're constantly a force for calm in the house, I think we still have our arguments and all the rest of it, but generally it's been fairly good, it's been fairly calm. Um, and to be honest, there, that's something I just wouldn't have, energy and calmness and not something I would have if I was drinking, because I would be tired, I'd be lethargic, I'd be grouchy, um, and it would be a nightmare. So for me, I'm, I know it sounds odd, but I'm looking on the bright side and getting on with it and quite enjoying it, because I know for a fact as well, in whatever it is, three months, four months, five months, six months, whatever, I'm going to be back at the office. I'm going to be working there. I'm going to be sat there waiting for 5.30 to come round so I can go home. And I'll be looking back on these days when I've had all day at home with the kids just to relax and enjoy ourselves. I am working, but the email count, my actual in the incoming emails that I have to deal with seem to be right down. So I think everyone's working from home at the moment. So everything seems to have slowed down or people are getting to grips with it slowly. Um, so I'm getting through it and I'm enjoying it. And as I say... We will all, in a few months' time, be right back with where we were, be it in an office or working on sites or whatever it is, um, and probably we'll be looking back on this thinking, I've got to sit at home for a few months, and just try and look on the bright side and enjoy it. That's all you can do. Uh, but for me, personally, I, I genuinely struggle to understand how people will get through this drinking, because you'll be waking up tired, grouchy, you'll be anxious and panicky, that's bad enough on its own, but if you sort of throw kids into the mix as well and have, you know, you're arguing with them all the rest of it, an absolute nightmare. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is difficult, but we make the most of our, obviously, in the UK, obviously, you're allowed out for um, one bit of exercise every day. So we do that first thing. So I set the alarm and we get up at 7.30. It's like a normal school day. We're out the house at 8. We do a couple of hours in the park. We cycle to the park. We park up. We then just... There's always stuff to do. You find some trees to climb on or some old logs to make a den out of or whatever. By the time you get home, everyone's had a good run around and they're fairly calm. Um, and then we just get on with the day. And yeah, their education is going to suffer and my work's going to suffer, but we'll muddle through as best we can. Um, and there we go. Um, so I think it's, is it just Lisa left, I think, now? Yay! Hi! <laughs> 
I don't like going last. <laughs> I've been waiting for my turn. Um, I get that, William. I think pos trying to stay positive. I'm not going to lie. I've actually Googled how to stay positive in a crisis. <laughs> I have had a look at that. Um, routine for me, I think, like, I missed what Mandy said because I got cut off before, so I hope it's not the same, and I'm sorry if it is. Um, but definitely routine. I've got to be careful, though, that I don't get too stuck in my routine, that it starts to cause me a little bit more stress because it kind of did that today. Um, but routine is an anchor for me. So knowing that I'm going to get up, I'm going to meditate, I have affirmations written in chalk pens on my mirrors in my bedroom, so I do my affirmations. I come down, I can talk the dog out, the cat out. I've been going for a little walk. Um, my youngest daughter then probably gets up about the afternoon and we've been listening music i've been listening to you know music that i used to listen to when i was like 17 18 and it's amazing so i've been like dancing around the kitchen and things like that i think you've got to be careful what you wish for haven't you because i use i've got three children and for the last what 21 years i've been wish, wishing for peace and quiet and my eldest daughter actually just moved out before all this. My son is locked down at his girlfriend, so there's just me and Olivia. So I've kind of got a lot of peace and quiet at the moment. So I think learning to sit with myself and um, med cooking. I've not stopped cooking. I've not stopped eating. <laughs> is anybody else the same? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, just things like that, but routine, FaceTime in family as well. I am so grateful for groups like this that you can pop into and see that you're not on your own. And um, the fact that we've all got phones and tablets and things, so I can be talking to my mum and my daughter at the same time, and then my son will pop on. So things like that have been keeping me sane. Um, yeah. I'm very excited, though, to hear about our special guest today, Jamie Lee Grace. What have you been doing to keep saying this week? Hi. Um, well, I have got four kids, and they're all at home. I mean, the older two are not usually at home much. One's back from uni. Um, the other one is is usually kind of spends some time at his girlfriend. So, so we suddenly have an absolute house full, and it feels like Christmas week but without all the good bits. <laughs> so I totally get where you're coming from. It's like constant cooking and eating and, and, and sort of fighting a bit about who's going to clean up. So I've got all of those kind of dynamics going on, really. Um, it's been really interesting for me because I'm really, I'm not very good at, um, at routine. A couple of you, if you have mentioned how good, how good it is if you have a routine in your life. And I, and I think that's really true to kind of set some boundaries around stuff. Um, I prefer to use the phrase rhythm. So I'm trying to get some kind of um, rhythm to my day. I am finding it hard, I have to admit. But, um, but I've got a lot, a lot going on because a lot of the stuff I do is online anyway. Um, I'm able to do my presenting stuff for the BBC online, amazingly. So, so that, that's still cool. Um, but I'm, I'm calling this time um, self-care isolation because I reckon that... Um, there's not much, there's a lot of stuff we can't do anything about. Um, we can only, we can only look after ourselves, really. We can only do the bits we can do for ourselves and for other people, you know, within reason. So, so I'm kind of looking at this as a time when we can all focus on what can we do to actually be kind to ourselves as well as other people. Um, what can we do? And in many cases, that's just, uh, well, we can boost our own immunity um, as best we can and we can look after our own mindset you know and, and um, that's kind of all we can do <laughs> but but that's enough that that will be pretty cool if we all manage to do that. Oh, that's really nice and what kind of practical tips have, uh, have you got for people then Janie in terms of what actually are you doing for self-care for instance? Well I mean personally I'm I'm really using this time to 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 make sure that all the stuff I bang on about, I actually do because <laughs> I'm really good at telling everybody else about holistic living and, and you know boosting immunity and boosting their well-being. And sometimes I get so caught up and so busy in the my new shy of life that I don't always do everything for myself. So so I am really massively upping vitamin C. 
Um, I've made my own vitamin C. I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> so I've got all the family on that. I'm, I'm making us all a fresh juice every day, or rather I'm getting the kids to. Um, so, you know, where I can get fresh fruit and veg, it's not always that easy. Um, so little things like that, getting the getting good stuff into the diet. And then in terms of the kind of um, headspace stuff, I think for me, the, the, the key is not to allow myself to get into that kind of fear state. Because even though I, I'm not normally particularly anxious, I have found myself really getting, particularly if I listen to the news too much. I mean, I've, one thing I've really learned is you, you absolutely cannot have the goddamn media on the whole time because it will send you nuts, absolutely nuts. And I, and at the beginning of all of this, I found myself um, watching too much. And so, and I was getting myself into a, a state of actual fear. So I've, I've kind of learned that there are some little tips and tricks that just can get, help you step away from that. And it, it usually just comes back to, to, to the body, to that mind-body connection. If, you're, if your brain knows that your body is safe and your body, you know, that, that kind of, in fact, psychologists call it the cybernetic loop actually what's going on between the body and brain is really important. So to answer your question, a really, really simple, tiny little tip is if you feel yourself getting into panic mode and fear, um, rather than allow you to, yourself to go off on down that those thoughts, actually literally just adopt a power pose and put, stand with your feet apart, your chest open and look up. And literally just that tiny change of posture actually sends a little message down to your, you know, from, from your body, which is actually actively doing something, um, a positive movement. It sends that little message to the brain. It's fine. You haven't got to run from the tiger. It's okay. You know, and then you can just from there, calm yourself down. And I think we all need to know what our own resources are. So I think you, I'm sure you spoke about this last week, but the sober toolkit thing that many of us know about, we actually need a lockdown toolkit and it needs to include preparation you know what are our resources what are the things that individually we all know will 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 bring us down and will just make us feel better however small anyone on the panel want to add anything to that about what they're doing practically for self-care oh just to pick up on what Janie said that Janie said the lockdown toolkit I absolutely love yeah. that and there's so many of the sober tools that you can bring yeah. into this situation like if you've never journaled, you know, this is a whole new experience. You know, start writing down what it's like every day, what, how that feels for you. And if you don't like writing, you can record voice, voice memos or do a quick video on your phone just to get those feelings out. And then you can look back at them. I mean, there, there are so many of those skills, tools that are, are transferable. So I absolutely agree. So anyone who here who's kind of gone through the, the journey and down the path to sobriety will probably be quite well set to, to handle some of the things that are coming up now. What would you say to somebody, because I know on this chat there's lots of people that are, you know, we're all at different times in our journey. What would you say to somebody that was thinking about giving up alcohol right now? Uh, if you, are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. yeah, sorry, okay. I'm, I'm okay. looking at you. Can you not see me looking at you? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody looking at me. <laughs> sorry, Jenny, <Jamie>, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I would say there has never been a better time to be sober. I mean, let's face it, alcohol lowers your immunity and massively increases anxiety. So right now, all of us need to boost our immunity. Whatever happens, whatever stage we're at, having a good, strong immunity is not going to do anyone any harm. So that's number one, really important for our physical health alcohol is is damaging for everything literally everything so that's that's a given but it massively increases anxiety and as we you already said at the beginning you know kind of sleep is affected everything is affected cooped up in in houses with other people you your stress levels are going to be be high so there's never been a better time to ditch the booze and and actually if you are to, you know thinking about it right now what, what a fantastic time to choose okay i'll do 30 days or i'll do 60 days however god knows how long this is going to go on maybe you'll get to do 90 days and at the end of that the likelihood of you going back is going to be slim and also the other positive thing to think about is that you won't have any of the hassles of going out to bars and clubs and pubs and being coerced by other people because you ain't going. So it really is just you and whoever you're locked down with that you need to navigate. And so I think actually it's a fantastic time, but you still got to do your prep. 
you can't you can't head into it without um without you know without doing your prep and choosing okay what are you gonna drink at the time you normally drink and and you know how are you going to deal with the cravings and the thoughts you've still got to do your prep so we um we have a question um that harriet says where can i find a list for the sober or lockdown toolkits so um i'm just gonna ask kate do you want to explain and then dave maybe what your what's in your toolkit and what do we mean by a sober toolkit yeah well the sober toolkit i think is a it's kind of you put it together as you go on in terms of things that work for you to like Jamie was saying a bit like come out of the panic state or manage triggers or cravings and I suppose we work at Love Sober we we work with adding adding things in so um, it'll be looking at body so what makes you feel safe I was thinking I've been doing this thing today of you take your right hands and you put it under your um, your armpit and then you take your left hand and you just put it on your shoulder or here and it's like it sort of contains you and it, and it sends it's like Jamie was saying it sends a message to your brain that you're safe and you can sit there for a while and just sort of breathe and it actually activates your parasympathetic nervous system and so that you literally work from body up. So, you know, I think some of the toolkit can be sort of quick lit. It can be very much rational minds. I mean, I know um, Sam's book is, William Porter's book was one of my seminal books for just attacking the kind of rationality and the science um, about it. So I think, you know, the quick, quick lit, the podcasts, um, the somatics like we're doing or whatever movement works for you um and what else just yeah so and the in i think for this time it's like treating things like a bit of an exploration so if you work with your body um also the things that you look out for things that you love that might light you up so i was making pom-poms with my daughter and just the feeling of the wool and the color I was in a bit of mindful activity and it just kind of lit me up and I bounced on the trampoline and it lit me up and it's it's those they're sort of like little bright spots which are like markers to you that you're doing something that you're genuinely kind of enjoying so again like you sort of add to those look for those bright bits look for those positive bits um yeah so I'd say that that's where I'm at right now with a mixture of kind of head stuff and, and sort of body stuff, I think getting out of the fear thing, and like you say, the kind of journaling is really, is really, really good as well. Any kind of moment to reflect and to check in with yourself. I must say just this one thing, because I've been thinking about this today. But while we're talking about routines, I've been thinking about, go with me for a bit, the Islamic call to prayer, right? And basically, I used to call, I used to say I've got a call to a cup of tea five times a day, right? Now, what I'm, I'm kind of linking this together in that actually what we can do, what that actually is for, for me, is my getting down on the ground. And it's an opportunity to check in with myself five times a day to just go, okay, how am I breathing? How's my body feeling? And what's this, what this does for me is it stops me letting the stress go triggered and up and up and up and sandwich and sandwich till I go, fuck it, I've got a fuck it button at witching hour, four to seven, which is when we're starting to come down. Um, so I'm, I'm like, I'm really going with this kind of, this routine of having a little check in with yourself five times a day. So, yeah. Um, hey, what's your sober toolkit? What do you understand it to be? Well, I, I just uh, think self-care is really important. And I know I don't look like I've got self-care because this is the more it goes on. We've got a bit of a beard of fun going on at the moment. But um, for me, as Janie says, I'm trying not to look to look at the news. I've turned my um, news app off my phone because it really depresses me. So I've been trying to do things really positive. I've set my bike up in my garden office on a turbo trainer and I've got a Zwift app that I 
can monitor how I'm doing and it's set to calendars each day. And I find once I've come off of that, I feel so much better and more more mentally prepared for the day. I've started listening to albums from back in the eighties that I loved, you know, that I, I my favourite albums and that immediately lifts my spirit. And as I said before, I, I'm just really trying to, to work out my mood swings. And if I'm feeling okay, run with that. If not, I do something about it. I just nip it in the bud because I just don't want to feel rubbish in these times. You know, there's not challenges indoors. As you know, we've got triplets. And uh, they're quite challenging. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's the other handy thing about the music is I can't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> So there's my tip. Wear headphones so you can't hear your kids even if you've not got your music on. Perfect. You say that, but I did actually have that like discovery the other day because I've been getting back into rave music because I used to be really into the rave scene. And um, like obviously it's not very sort of social for your family. <laughs> um, and then I thought like, like if I wear headphones, no one can hear me. So I was listening to like like old school jungle, which is not that appropriate for like a 40 year old woman but I was having the best time really loud whilst cleaning the kitchen and it's just like yeah. it's like it doesn't matter like whatever I mean your talk is whatever works for you it's bespoke for you it's like what brings you up you know gets the adrenaline going whether it's running dancing you know laughing it's the things that sort of keep you comforted so whether that's a hot bath or wrapping yourself in blankets you know it's all the things that you might have reached for alcohol but replaced by something that is going to look after you, not damage you, essentially. Um, okay, is there any other questions? William, stay on the time. Can I just add to that? Because we were talking yesterday in Simon's group, myself and Lisa, similar sorts of things and practical tips for when you feel triggered. And there'll be, there'll be people here, and certainly watching the playback later, who are uh, maybe right, very early on sober and now are worried that they're not going to maintain it because they haven't got a loaded toolkit like maybe we've got. Um, or other people who want to start out on that journey because now is a good time to do it. And we were talking about what else you can do instead of, you know, giving in to the craving. And we, we had some really practical advice, just, you know, things like that. Okay, even getting up and going out of the room will temporarily numb the craving. Lisa, you had an idea about the things you would do. <laughs> what do you pick a drink? I can't even remember. Is this I'll tell you. It was only yesterday, I'm sorry, and I knew she was going to ask me something, and I can see her, and I'm thinking, I have no idea what we can all say. Lisa was saying that before you pick up a drink. Oh yeah. Go on, you can take. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe have a list of things that you will commit to before you think about picking up a drink. So if you get that craving, if you've brought a list and you promise yourself before you ever have a drink, you will complete these. So it could be just five things um, that you'll do. It could be. You could phone a friend, you could pick up a book, maybe read a podcast. What was it you said, Simon, about somebody with a, a photograph with the kids or something? Well, there was a couple, actually. So there was a guy that I was doing some coaching with, and he had a really awful video of himself when he was drunk. He was, you know, It was kind of regrettable behaviour stuff, and someone had sent him a video of it. And he made a non-negotiable absolute honest agreement with himself that if he was ever going to drink he would watch that video first to remind himself of how bad it was and he said to me if I ever watch that video that's enough to stop me drinking so yeah that kind of not it's an I call it a non-negotiable yeah you know, the the, th the thing you're sort of not prepared to put alcohol in front of any longer or a kind of commitment you're going to make to to yourself before you drink and it could be like you say just a it might just be a picture of you with your kids or yeah, just a picture of your children can be enough to make you stop for a moment and think, do you know what? Is this really worth it? Where is this going to lead? Play it forward, that kind of thing. Sam, before we go back to um, to Janie on this, what what is the science behind cravings in terms of, you know, what, what is it? When you're feeling anxious that makes you think drink. What is that? 
Well, yeah, so, I mean, that's, we didn't do uh, that. Over to you, sorry, was that to me or Simon? Yeah, to, to you, William. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Of course, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> there's a few things that's going on there. The subconscious um, is the part of your brain that works by repetition. So if you do something over and over again with the same result, um, you start to do it subconsciously. So, for example, um, sort of a good example is when you get a car and you've got the indicator on the right um, or on the left and you get a new car and you're constantly turning the windscreen wipers on when you're trying to indicate. Uh, you just get used to doing the same thing. Now, because alcohol is a chemical depressant, it does take the edge off anxiety in the short term. So over the years, as you're drinking, you get that knee-jerk reaction so that whenever you get any kind of anxiety, be it genuine anxiety or anxiety caused by the previous drinking, um, that you have that immediate knee-jerk reaction to reach for a drink to get rid of it. But I think the other thing to do, and going back to the points that... Um, Simon was just making, sometimes you just need to interrupt that thought process because the, the, the thinking is you can think about seven things at the same time. So in your mind, you can have seven things that you're thinking about. Now, if you're getting into a panic about whether to drink or whether to not drink, there's going to be lots of things going on in your mind. Like, I don't know, I'm really upset at the moment. Um, I'm in lockdown. The kids are driving me up the wall. You're then going to be thinking, yeah, but I've committed to stop and it's expensive and it's not good for me and all the rest of it you can have hundreds and hundreds of things dancing through your mind but the problem is you can only think of seven so all you need to do is to get seven reasons to drink in your mind and you haven't got any of the reasons not to drink there so that's usually when you have that panicky thing where you quickly reach for a drink and have one um so anything that interrupts that thought process because it's a panicky knee-jerk reaction kind of thought process anything that interrupts it and just lets you take a break for a minute and get away from it um, is going to be useful. I, I call it the spiral of craving. It's a spiral. You sort of get more and more in a panic over it. Um, but it is purely conscious thought and you can just get away from it quite easily. And, and anything that interrupts that sudden panicky downward spiral is going to work for you. And again, it's when you're asking about where's the sober toolkit, it's not you know here's 40 things that everyone uses we all use separate things that keep us off that and over the years it just becomes second nature i mean the big one for me and it always has been the thing i hated most about drinking was waking up at three or four in the morning lying there really anxious um, and when i understood that that was a direct chemical result of the drinking that was one of the big nails in the coffin for me um, and now there's nothing that will cause me to have a drink because I just I hate lying there at three or four in the morning feeling, feeling tired, but also anxious and restless all at the same time. It's just such a horrible feeling. I just don't want it anymore. Um, so for me, that that's it. Kate, hey, you got your hand up? Yeah, it's just occurring to me. Thank you for that. Just that it's, I find it helpful to have, if I'm thinking about it, it's like the emergency strategies when the cravings are quite big and they're flying up and then the sort of almost like proactive strategies about keeping you you sort of regulated throughout the day which is what I was talking about with the taking the break and checking in so sort of a, you know when identifying when your trigger times are when you're you know if it is that five to seven o'clock and at that point it will pass so always playing it forward and then okay, I have a cup of tea, maybe I have something sweet. In the early days, I definitely had to have that kind of, because the blood sugar was probably going a bit, you know, haywire. Um, just in changing the routine as well, just like literally just go and do something else, change your environment, like like you were saying, Sam. And um, But then having those then working back from them to try and stop you know, that stress building up over the day. And that's, I think that goes back to our routines that we were talking about, a bit kind of where we started off in the first bit. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just going to add my two pen of them. No, no, thank you. Uh, Janie, can we just go back to you now and talk a little bit about the wine witch? <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I similarly to... Um, to, to Sam used to wake up at 3 a.m. without fail. It was always 3 a.m. And I had this voice in my head that um, that said, you know, um, 
this this is right what you're doing is not is not right you're meant to be interested in living holistically and healthy you're talking to other people about you know ditching chemicals and skincare and god knows what and yet you're caning the booze this is not okay and it's got to stop and the voice was so strong at 3 a.m and i hated myself and it was it was very very strong so i would make a decision kind of every day that right that's it i'm not going to drink again um and then by i don't know six six o'clock or or whatever you know um if it was a sunny day it would be lunchtime um i would literally hear a different voice in my head um and and to me that was the voice of the wine which people have different names but the wine which was really really a definite voice that said to me you know go on have a lovely cheeky little sauvignon you know the sun's out it's nice and chilled you deserve it you're such a busy had such a busy day you know you're so stressed with the kids you're, and all that crap that um, that uh, the wine witch comes out with, um, and and it was it was such a strong voice. I know this is, might may sound odd, but I remember actually asking a therapist once. I remember saying to a therapist because I felt safe enough to share that I thought I was drinking too much. Of course, the answer is usually, "Oh well, you know, sounds normal." Um, but I actually said to this therapist, um, "It's like I've got a voice telling me to go and drink a, another glass, even though I don't want another glass of wine. It's like a voice is." compelling me to go drink another glass um and she had no concept of what I was talking about didn't have a clue which is what kept me stuck for so long for so many years I thought I was the only person that felt like that um now so many more of us are talking about this it's fantastic but uh, but at the time I thought there were just the two types of drinkers there were those at rock bottom who are alcohol dependent need alcohol services that clearly wasn't me and then everybody else who was perfectly okay with it all so here was I being very odd in having a voice in my head um and then over time of course when I once I'd you know ditched the booze I um I, I discovered that this is a real thing the addictive voice is a thing you can call it what you like but it, but it's a thing and not everyone has it but those who do um can recognize that they do I mean I call it not having an off switch you know I don't have an off switch um, so whereas I can drink one cup of coffee and be happy and satiated and, and I don't need to have 15 cups of coffee, it's not the same with alcohol. Uh, anyways, so I, I discovered the uh, fascinating world of um, Jack Trimpe, if you want to get into uh, old style reading, um, who wrote um, a book called Rational Recovery and, it, and actually coined this, this, this phrase, the addictive voice recognition technique. Um, and it's a, a very kind of long-winded way of saying, um, recognize that if you have a voice, if you have a voice telling you to drink, accept it, acknowledge it, recognize it. Once you've acknowledged that, you can, you can look it straight in the eye and you can deal with it then. And you can reframe those thoughts that are coming at you. It's a long Thanks, answer, Sarah. sorry. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a, it's a useful answer. Thank you. Um, just going back to toolkit as well, we have got three people in our panel with books out. Um, it's the one that got me sober. Thank you, William. Um, Simon's the one that keeps me sober. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Janie, uh, yeah, you know I've read your book. I tell you about it every time we're talking. I really useful tips for dealing with the wine with. And ladies on Love Sober, yours is out in September, is that right? Is that still on? It is, yeah. It looks like Dave. You, you, me, and Lisa are going to have to get right in. <laughs> well, I've been spending too much time uh, making my soap the pants. So. <laughs> <laughs> have you got the sober pants, Dave? Well, hold on a minute. Oh, oh. Oh, <laughs> 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 Can I just add an underwear range? There's Claire in the questions there, and she's just said, and I love this, and I think it's something, because we've spoke so much about how much, you know, for people struggling at this moment, but Claire's just said, you know, she agrees that being sober now is the best gift that we can give ourselves, um, and just thank God that we're not drinking through this. Her two kit, she says she's using mindful coffee. Alex, you should take note of that. Oh, um, don't start again on me with my coffee. <laughs> meditation, hot baths with a candle, calling someone when she feels fretful, preparing nice pots of tea, stretching, crazy music, playlists, and, and then she ends it with We Are The Lucky Ones. And I've just got to say, we are, aren't we? 
me earlier. Yeah. I think well, I think that, that that whole thing about gratitude is such a big part of this piece as well. You know, that just being so thankful for what we do have. And I think it's just one tiny little thing that absolutely everyone can do is just keep that gratitude list that we all know about. But now more than ever, actually keep a gratitude list, but make it really detailed. So it's not just, oh, I'm grateful for my home or my family or enough food actually really detailed lists where you kind of write at least 10 things maybe that happened that day specifically you know I'm really I'm really grateful that I actually was only 55 in the queue when I tried to get my food or whatever um you know and I think sometimes that can just help remind you of these little things you know Catherine Gray's fabulous book, The Unexpected Joy of the Ordinary. I am loving that book right now. It's every little thing she's got in there. Is, you know, this, this current situation is making every single one of us focus on the ordinary and practice gratitude for what we already have. Yeah, it's really true. Simon, um, we were talking yesterday on your, um, your group again about tips. Um, anything else to add? I don't know kind of throwing you in a little bit without you really thinking what we were talking about but any other tips on staying sober getting sober pull them directly from the book let's pull them directly from the book <laughs> <laughs> i i think i mean aside from the coronavirus panic which is a whole separate thing but definitely you know we were just talking about books funny enough that was how i started you know my journey i rather like Janie said around sort of a long period of being stuck in this place where I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was the only person. I didn't know how to change. So I just kept drinking to blot out those kind of voices that I had going on. And then eventually I just took those baby steps forward. And I, I picked up a book and, you know, the rest is history, so to speak. And the I, I think the first step after becoming aware that there's an issue you need to confront in your life is starting to educate yourself about it. And it, it's just like with anything. And for me, sobriety felt like learning a new skill. You know, I couldn't pick up a violin and play it first time I got it. I had to. I haven't got a violin, by the way. But I, the point is, if you, know, you started trying to play the violin immediately, you wouldn't get a very good tune out of it. But if you keep working on it and taking little steps forward, eventually you might just get a tune. You probably will get a tune out of it. And sobriety felt like that to me. You know, I snapped a few strings and I smashed a few Stradivariuses on the way, but eventually I got where I needed to be. So it's education and the, you know, and there's so much stuff out there. Nobody can make the excuse that there's not the resources, there's not the tools, there's not the support. It's it's free. There's paid support. There's everything from one to one coaching through to free Facebook groups. It's it's all out there. And then from education, it's really moving to a place where you start putting what you've learned into practice, which is, I guess, you know, playing the violin in a in a village hall in front of a few people. You know, you actually go out and start doing it and and experiencing the world without alcohol in it and getting it all down, journaling it, seeing what it's like. And the best thing is, it's just a, it's wonderful. I know another start like, to me, it was full. Of, I was so scared and afraid and. I remember going to my first gig without drinking and thinking, this is actually amazing. It was like seeing it with a new set of eyes. And I ended up coming away thinking how, how awful it was, all the gigs that I'd been blind drunk at that I couldn't remember. And I could even remember most of the set list two or three days later. It was Mumford and Sons at the O2 Arena. And it's just amazing. And not needing to go for a pee every five minutes because I was... And carrying three pints of beer with one between your teeth. It was just amazing. But really, the first, as I said, the simple answer is the first step for me was actually taking that step and picking up a book and starting to educate myself about it. Yeah, uh, yeah I, think, I think that's most people's starting point is actually learning about it or hearing somebody else's experience that gets them curious. Um, I know, I, I don't think Jane will mind me saying um, your trigger was Claire Pooley, um, Lisa's was Unexpected Joy of Being Sober, mine, like I say, was William's book, Annie's book, and so on. And you know, we all take inspiration from other people. Um, we've got a question here, and it advice do you have ones whose partners are getting sober during this pandemic? Sorry, um, I'm very lucky that my husband went sober with me, and he at first he's been for a year, 
Um, I don't know whether he's going to carry it on. I don't care whether he carries it on. It's been enough to kind of spur me on. But not everybody's that lucky. I've got my best friend, Lisa, and I've got my husband. So I'm cocooned from reality in many ways. What advice do we have? Dave, I'm going to come to you because I know you have gone, you were the only one to go sober in your relationship, I think. I've got that right. Yeah, she's a raging wino. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's not listening. No, no, she drinks. Um, and I must admit, at first, I struggled with that a little bit, uh, especially the smell. You know, we go to bed and that, and I can smell the wine. But we've kind of come to an agreement now that um, if she wants to have a drink, which isn't a lot, and she is uh, mm. one of those people that can have a couple and just have a cup of tea after, I. I say, right, so I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to watch a film now because I don't really want to be there while she has a drink. But I, who am I to actually say you can't have a drink because it's my problem? So we, we've come to a sort of an agreement with it. And, and if we go out, I don't really care anyway. You know, I, I'm driving and I'm enjoying people's company. So I think it's what works for you and the, and the partner, really, how, how you both can work around it, really. And she's now downloaded an app as well that she marks what day she's had a drink. And in the last seven days, she's just marked one star. In, and so it helps her to be more mindful as well. It's a really good idea. But she said, oh, look, I've only, had, I've only drank once in the last week. And I think it's a good reminder as well. It kind of highlights your partner's drinking sometimes, doesn't it? Or the people around you when you decide to go sober, they're kind of like, oh, I didn't realise I had that much. Um, I'm not the one to ask for this because I left mine. I'll, I'll, I'll jump <laughs> in. Sober. Can I say something on that one, actually? Because my, my wife still drinks, albeit moderately, and we used to drink every night together, and I felt... I hated it when she didn't drink at the same time as me. I would encourage her to drink because she, she never had a problem. Although I say she drank every night, she'd just have one or two glasses. I'd have one or two bottles, but it made me feel better about myself if she drank at the same time as me. And I have seen so many times with the people in my group, the people I coach with, where when they've quit drinking, just like Dave said, their partners become mindful about it. They start to see the magic, the darkness under the eyes of their, you know, their partners looking 10 years younger. They think they've got a new, a new spouse and the, uh, they want a piece of the action in many cases. And they don't always stop drinking completely. Some may just become mindful or start to drink moderately. And I, I now, a bit like Dave, I mean, I haven't got a problem with my wife's drinking. She, she drinks a couple of times a week. She's very mindful of it, as Dave said. And I often think, she, there was a point where she said to me, oh, you know, are you okay if I have a drink, you know, if we go out for a meal or something like that? And I said, well, if I was vegan, um, I'm not vegan, but if I was vegan, would you eat meat in front of me? And she was like, well, yeah. And I said, well, it's the same. To me, this is a lifestyle choice. It's my decision. It doesn't matter if you do that. And you know, it was nice, and I understand why she asked me that. Um, but it's it is a, a journey, and you do end up inspiring other people along the way, whether that's your partner, your friends, and that's one of the wonderful things about it. It's it's one thing that is good to catch is the you know, the inspiration to start looking at your drinking from someone else. Yeah, so I would say, so I'm reading that again, and it says some advice for loved ones whose partners are getting sober. So I think it's, so So what I'm thinking is that a couple of things, I think it's really helpful to keep it separate and say you're both grown-ups, right? It depends on the level of drink. It depends on the whole, you know, is it, you know, are you, how much support might be needed? So I would always say, get some support, get some outside support. So find the tribe and find the appropriate support. Encourage your partner to lean on appropriate support because I do think it's too much to put into a relationship for you to be that container for helping that person become sober. That's maybe if you're still drinking, right? Or even if you're sober, if they're going through their sober journey, it's, it, it's like having good boundaries with that, I think. So I would say, remember that you're both grown-ups. 
have respect and encourage your partner just to get other support as a bit of a container for you both during that time because it is quite a lot to go through and put put that in your relationship you know and it's the same i honestly believe if you're both starting out at the same time there's still that argument because if one falls off it can trigger the other so it's almost like try to encourage that in responsibility for your own sobriety and get get the outside templates and support that would be mine yeah it's good advice i, I like that very much um i think simon and lisa you say that well lisa you are an example i got sober because i saw lisa sober and i wanted a piece of it similar to what simon's just said uh, you see people around you and you surround yourself by your tribe you want in and i think that's a really good motivator for getting sober anyone want to add anything to that before we wrap up because we are at the hour i think um just to you know i obviously i live in france with a, a frenchman and, and a wine cellar i say this every week um but you know i think people have this idea that like it's not possible because of your situation like i've heard that like you know you know, Janie works in the media, people that work in the media, you can't get sober in the media, you know, because everyone drinks. Like, you can't get sober when you're married to a Frenchman because all French people drink, you know. Whatever the scenario, it, it, it tends to often get um, attached to someone else and someone else's behaviour. And it was very difficult for me to detach from that, you know, and detach from the romanticism of my life in France and living with a Frenchman and him knowing about wine and, and, and that being very integral into our relationship. Um, but it's nothing to do with him. You know, it's absolutely nothing to do with him. It's to do with me and to do with my well-being. He still drinks. I don't. We're fine. Um, oh, Claire lives in France too. No way. Okay. Um, we'll have to chat. Uh, yeah. So it is, um, you know, anything's possible and it's, it's, uh, you know, just your own spheres, and I think that's really important. And and this kind of, you know, this feeling of responsibility. You know, uh, obviously we work as coaches with people with addictions. You know, I I am I can't control what one of my clients d does. I can support them, and I can and I can give them resources, but it, essentially, you know, I can't control people, places, and things. They're not. That's not my. Uh, within my sphere of influence, I can only support, and, and that's all you can do as a partner, is be there, be non-judgmental, um, be supportive, um, and, you know, and and know that they can always come back and they can always try again, you know, because that's all they need. They need to just know that they, they've got another chance, basically, within the limits of your own capacity, essentially. Right, um I think we're out of questions so just to say to everybody um who's watched thank you very much for joining us we hope we've been of some help to you today um you can find all of us on facebook and and the usual social media i think the best place to start is probably instagram we all have an instagram account um you want to just quickly give your instagram handles everybody so man and lisa's is at sober experiment um william alcohol explained dave at Sober Day. Uh, Mandy? Uh, at love.sober.co uh, lo <laughs> with Kate. With Kate, yeah. And you've got your individual ones as well, which we can yeah. from that. Um, so Kate, do you want to give yours? Are you happy with that? You me? Yeah. Love.sober.co, same as Mandy. And I'm <laughs> like Kate underscore love.sober and Mandy's is Mandy underscore love dot sober. So You'll never see. remember that. We'll try to post them. Uh, Simon? Uh, mine's at be sober and quit. And finally, um, Janie, we can find you. Yeah, mine's just at Janie Lee Grace. And I also run the Sober Club, but I don't have a name for that on Instagram. But you've got an awesome <laughs> podcast as well. If you haven't checked out Janie's podcast, yeah. definitely listen to that because it's brilliant. Yeah, listen to your episode. And Dave's yes. episode. <laughs> 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 and Mandy and the Cakes is coming up. Yeah, the, the podcast is called Alcohol Free Life. Uh, we hope we've been of some help to you all. We are back next week at four o'clock and we will post the link as usual. Thanks very much for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.